Good evening and welcome from the Ruth Heyman Trust. A very warm welcome and we're really looking forward to this interview between our two distinguished patrons, Sue McGregor and Lord Alf Dubbs. But just before this interview gets started, I'd just like to say a few words about the Trust and um, our links with refugees because this is our event for Refugee Week and refugees do have a special place for the Trust. Ruth Heyman herself came here to seek sanctuary. She was a distinguished um, lawyer and she defended many anti-apartheid activists and she fled here from the regime to London. She set up English classes for people who'd come to settle here. I think they were mainly women at that time. And she was also one of the founder members of NATECLA, the National Association for Teachers of English and Community Languages. And it was in her name that the Ruth Heyman Trust, uh, in NATECLA set up the trust in her name. And that was in 1983, so we've been going quite, quite some time. And certainly um, refugees are very important to us. Most of our grants are for education for refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, now, last year we gave 201 awards um, for over 90,000 pounds. And of these uh, 167, were people coming here to seek sanctuary. So it was over 80% were refugees and asylum seekers. And they came from 52 different countries of the world. The highest number came from Syria, which um, is hardly surprising given what is happening in Syria at, 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 at the moment. And we supported them on a range of courses from basic English right up until professional qualifications. And I'll just give a couple of examples. We supported 10 refugees from Syria to study ESOL, English, at West Lothian College in Scotland, because the Scottish government for some reason withdrew funding for Scottish national qualifications. So we were able to step in and fund the full amount in liaison with the college and the, a refugee organization. So that was for basic English. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we supported seven dentists for the exams they need to take to work here, which are incredibly expensive. They're in the thousand pounds and a thousand is our maximum award. So just to mention two dentists who we supported with 500 pounds each in March, and that was what is hopefully on the final stage of their long journey to work here as dentists for exams for the membership of the Faculty of Dental Surgeons. So it doesn't have to be a large amount, even small amounts can make a real difference to refugees' lives. And I'd like you to introduce you to Naima, who is my fellow trustee who was herself many years ago a beneficiary and got quite a small amount. Um, I think, Naima, it was just about £100. So yes, can you was. tell us a bit about Hello, yourself? Everyone. Tell us a bit about yeah. yourself and um, how it helped you. Hello, everyone. My name is Naima, as um, Mary have told you. I came to this country as a refugee and uh, while I was waiting uh, for my papers of stay to be decided, I wanted to learn a language and uh, go into further education and uh, get a qualification to find a job and work. So um, I come from Somalia um, as a refugee and uh, that is the time when I um, was in a limbo situation and I couldn't work where I come across the uh, trust uh, for help to um, apply for university. And I needed to do a test, IELTS test, which I couldn't afford at the time. And the trust paid 100 pounds uh, to do that test, to 
to access university, which helped a lot. And uh, it was many years ago, but I remember vividly. And um, tell us about how you got on at university and what happened after that and what you're doing now. Yes, um, after learning the language, I joined university. I uh, qualified as a pharmacist, uh, learned pharmacy, uh, got a degree uh, from University of Hertfordshire. And uh, after that, I joined a big company and uh, I work among uh, um, many pharmacists and pharmacy technicians who are preparing prescriptions for patients um, who uh, suffer cancer and uh, uh, patients who cannot take food by mouth. So we prepare parenteral nutrition. So that's, that's my job at the moment, um, working uh, with my qualification. That's, that's really fantastic, Naima. And of course, you're also working um, as a voluntary trustee with, uh, with the trust, which is terrific for us. And just yeah. to say that um, all the trustees, like Naima and me, um, we're all volunteers. We don't have any paid workers. So that means that we have very, very low overheads. I think it was about 99% of the money we raised went directly to applicants, which um, I, I, I think is really, re really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Okay, well, thank you, Naima. And um, I'm now going to pass over to um, Sue McGregor and Lord Alf Dubbs, who both need no introduction to, for me, but I will say just a couple of, of things. Um, Sue McGregor has actually been a patron of the Trust for over 20 years, which I think is absolutely amazing. And the number of times, Sue, that you, you've helped us, um, I think the last occasion was when we had an evening with Peter Hayne, Lord Peter Hayne, when you interviewed him. And that was before lockdown in the days when we were able to actually meet in, in, in person. So Sue has had a very distinguished career um, and um, I, I'm sure you all know about her fantastic career with the BBC. And Lord Alf Dubbs is a more recent patron and we were absolutely delighted when he agreed to become a patron. And this was just before lockdown, so we've never had the chance actually to meet in person, Lord, Lord Dubbs, but uh, let's hope that uh, later in the year this might be possible. So I'll now hand over to you, Sue, and um, it's all yours. Oh, thank, thank you very you much. For oh, <laughs> yes, and thank, thank you. The, um, I, de I don't dare call you Alf immediately, Lord Dubs, but uh, oh, I think I think somebody has muted you. For once, we can't hear you, Lord right. Dubs. Well, first of all, you, you, <laughs> please please call me Alf. Of course, you dare. Is that but, all right? Uh, preferably, preferably. Oh, yes. good. Thank you, very much. you may remember that we, I, I had, I was lucky enough to interview you before a few years ago. I mean, I know you do about a hundred interviews, you know, per per week, but you know, you're, you're such a good talker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to do, if I may, um, Alf, is to. There will be a lot of people seeing you um, for the first time, sort of live, as it were, possibly watching mm -hmm. on their own screens. Um, and what I'd uh, like to do is, because it is such a fascinating story, your life, um, am I allowed to say that you were born in 1932 and mathematicians will work out that you're roughly 88? Is that still correct? You're allowed to say all these things. Yes, of course it's correct. <laughs> but what, what I'd like to uh, is, uh, ask uh, um, or inform some people about who don't know what your uh, childhood was like was um, you, you were born in Prague when it was then, it was still part of Czechoslovakia, I think, at that point. Um, yes, your right. father was Jewish, your mother, I think, was not. Um, and you were six um, after the Nazis occupied Prague. And that must have been a really frightening time for you. Um, and it did indeed end up with you uh, taking part through your father, probably, he must have arranged it, or your father and mother, that you went on this famous train, the Kindertransport, and managed to get out 
of Prague at the right time. Would you like to tell people what that was like for a six-year-old boy? Well, yes, as far as the best I can remember. Uh, because when the Germans occupied Prague in March, March 1939, my father, being, as you said, being Jewish, he left immediately. My mother tried to leave and was refused permission. So she then put me on a kinder transport. Uh, the German occupation was very dramatic. Uh, as I've said, said to people before, I had to tear, we had to tear a picture of the Czech president, President Benish, out of our school books, stick in a picture of Hitler. There were German soldiers all over the place. I don't think I can claim to have understood the significance of what was going on. I knew there were tensions. I knew there were anxieties. My father disappeared. But on, but on, on the whole, I think at the age of six, I was simply... Uh, carried on, carried over by the by the what was happening without fully understanding it till some years later. Yeah. So my, and you weren't you weren't even with your parents at that point on the kinder transport, were you? No, no, no. My father, my father I was very lucky, luckier than many, because my father uh, had escaped, as I said, and, and he, he'd got to London. So he had somebody waiting for me. And my mother had to say goodbye to me, not knowing whether whether she would she would see me again. So to that extent, yes, I was on my own. I didn't know anybody. There were about, a, I don't know, 150 of us on this train. I can still see my mum standing on the platform, Prague Station, German soldiers with swastikas in the background, uh, lots of tearful parents. Again, uh, I was one of the youngest, six years old, so I'm not sure I fully understood. Well, I don't think I understood what was happening. But I think she gave, you a, she gave you a parcel of food, which you didn't eat for two days. Is that right? Well, it was meant to be my, my my food my food for the journey. But when I got to London, my father saw it in my little knapsack and said, "But you haven't touched your food the whole time." Well, I wasn't aware I hadn't touched touched my food, but there it is. Oh. That, that, that's what happened. That's what he said. And you didn't have any English, did you? Could you? Did you have any words of English in your in your head at all when you got to London? I think I had two or three words of English, but but, but basically, I spoke Czech and German. Uh, and as I say to people. If I ever make a bad speech, well, English, English is my third language. I'm doing my best. But, but to, be, to, be, to be serious, you know, at the age of six, uh, one learns English pretty quickly <laughs> because it's a matter of survival in a school playground. The older one gets, the more difficult it is. So to that extent, uh, it was almost seamless by just learning English. I had a few hiccups on the way, but it didn't take me long. Uh, how long did it take you, though, really to feel that you were at home in, in Britain? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I was probably regarded a bit odd at school. Uh, so uh, I, I suppose I managed all right. Uh, I suppose I managed all right within about a year or two. Uh, you, you know, I think it, it, my, my mother, what happened was because my mother escaped at the last minute. She arrived in England the day before the war started, and then my father died a few months later. So it was just my mum and me. And oh. I think the problem of being in another country was much tougher for my mum, widowed, no job, no income, nothing, uh, was much tougher for her than for me because I just went along with the flow at school. What was your What was your ambition at that stage? Were, you know, let's 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 put you put you now as old as maybe about ten. And you were at a presumably at a good school and enjoying it by then, hopefully. Well, um, well, it was more precise. Sorry, it was a bit more complicated than that. Uh, the, the Czech government uh, had uh, had a boarding school for Czech ch child refugees in Britain, so my mum sent me to that, and that's that that was at the age of ten. So, in in a sense, I was then with a lot of Czechs. Again, I was one of the youngest with a, with a lot of fellow Czechs. Uh, but but yes. Uh, you know, it kept my check going a bit, and, and I learned lots of useful things, and it was quite an interesting experience. And by the time you left school in your teens, um, uh, did you go off to university immediately, and did you yeah. know what you wanted to be? Um, well, I was passionate. I, I then, uh, from about the age of 12 or 13, I became passionately interested in politics, more than most of my contemporaries. Uh, and uh, I think it was because I was puzzling as to why what had happened to me had happened to me. And I think I was trying to, at that point, I was really trying to understand, you know, what Hitler meant, Nazis and so on, and the significance of it all. And, and, and I, think, I think I came to the conclusion, I'm trying not to be wise after the event. It's easy to be like an Einstein at the age of 12. I certainly wasn't all by now. But um, I, I think I was trying, I was, my thinking was roughly this, that if evil men 
can do these terrible things in politics to their fellow human beings, maybe politics can also be used to reverse the process. So I was passionately interested in politics all the time uh, for, from then onwards, and I still am. When you say politics, I'm thinking that you probably were then uh, 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 more interested in the Labour Party than the Conservative Party, for instance. Uh, I, oh, absolutely. I was, uh, I was, uh, when, when, well, I'll tell you a little story. So my mum came the 1945 general election. We were living in Manchester and I was uh, following all the Labour candidates, all the candidates, they're all on posters and so on. And then, and then my mum took me for a week to a boarding house in near Blackpool, just for a week's holiday. It's great. She had a job by them. And um, uh, it, because of the votes coming back from the soldiers in the Far East, they didn't start counting the votes at night. They started counting the votes in the morning. And it was six weeks after election day to allow for the ships to bring the ballot papers back from Burma and so on. Uh, so um, the, the voting started one morning. And there's no television. So the BBC had a loudspeaker in, 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 in the village, in the little town. And they were going to have a lunchtime uh, announcement of the results. So the people in the boarding house said, well, go and have a look and tell us what's happening. So anyway, the lunchtime score, I remember something like Labour 130, Conservatives 20. So I went back very proudly to the boarding house and said, what's happening? And I said, Labour 120, the Conservatives 30 or something. Uh, and I heard a voice say, oh, my God, it's the end of England. <laughs> Well, it wasn't quite. Um, uh, anyway, Blackpool sounds a nice place to be for somebody w when you were that age, that young age. But did, oh. were you then sort of uh, keen to, to be a Labour MP? I mean, or was oh, yes. it too early for you to judge whether that would be good for you or not? Well, 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 my ambition was to go to the London School of Economics, which I thought was a good place for Labour people to go as a university. Uh, and uh, my ambition politically was to see if I could get onto a local council. I decided that being a refugee, English being my third language, what chance did I have of becoming an MP? Uh, and, and it stayed like that for some time. And then um, and then I, I happened to meet lots of Labour Party people, of course, and one of them said, go on, have a go for Parliament. So I did become a councillor, but I did have a go for Parliament, and eventually that worked. Yeah. Well, the, you, you, the, that certainly did work but um were you uh, conscious during this period were, were people um are still sometimes in, in britain rather um uh, suspicious of foreigners and i just wonder whether you felt um that you were not quite yet part um a real sort of brit as it were uh, well, in in these councils i can give you two uh, two little stories about that uh, first of all my mum had a terrible job uh, finding jobs and things. And uh, she was turned down for a job she'd done for six months, turned down, nobody appointed, applied again and so on. And what happened then was she heard one of the interview panel say, after her second failed appointment, that we're not giving a job to that bloody foreigner. Mm. My mother did sound very, much more Central European, uh, well, totally Central European. And, and she was so upset. And I, I shared that feeling. She was agonized because she didn't know what she was going to do. She couldn't stay in a job where she'd been turned on twice and so on. Uh, so I was, uh, on the other side of it, I my first go at Parliament uh, was, was for a seat I wasn't going to win, which was the cities of London and Westminster, which is, after all, the central constituency in London, with the House of Parliament sitting there and so on. And my conservative opponent was Christopher Tugendhat. So we had, the, we had the spectacle of a refugee from Vienna competing with a refugee from Prague. Now he won, and he went on to do great things, the European Commission and so on. But the media never picked up that story. I was quite surprised. I don't know. That's, I'm, yeah, I'm, that's it. You must have prob probably liked each other quite a lot. Because oh, of yeah. That. And we're in the Lords together, and, and, and there was one time he, he, he mentioned the fact that we'd competed. Uh, and, and I interrupted him to say in a loud voice, yes, but you won. <laughs> people, people laughed. But, yeah, yeah, we were quite friendly. And at what point, uh, was it close to that time at all, did you become really interested, and because we want to talk quite a lot about this if, if, if we have time for it, um, about what it's, about, you know, the, the whole purpose of this really is to to uh, try and make life better for refugee children now as then. Um, when did you first see the possibility of being able to help 
refugee children? Uh, it wasn't that time, perhaps, but a little later on in your life. Well, well it, it, yes, it was a bit later on. But when I got to the, when I got to the, well, I was quite keen. I was a local councillor, and I was quite keen that we should do more to support Uganda Asians and people like that. You know, and go back to the seventies. That would. Have been that's right. Different. Yes, I, I, yeah. I, well, I was a councillor in Paddington in the seventies, and mm -hmm. we actually, although it was a Conservative-run council, we actually had a majority of both parties were split on the issue. A majority saying we should give some housing to uh, uh, Uganda Asian families coming coming to Britain. So I was conscious of it then, and I was also conscious of race relations and all, all those issues. But I, I suppose then I got the Commons, and I, and I oh, there's one little story I'm going to tell you, if I may. Um, so yes, I was please. put on the, put on that small committee dealing with the British Nationality Act, uh, public 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 field committee, or standing committee as it then was called, and um, and so I thought there were 18 of us MPs, all parties, and here am I, a naturalised Brit determining the future pattern of British citizenship. And I thought, what other country would give me that opportunity? I, was, I, so I, I had to keep pinching myself that it was me me there or me asking Margaret Thatcher questions. I, I just couldn't believe it. However, I was then given, in this, my, my second term, uh, I was then given a job on the front bench and, and on the Home Affairs team. And one of the, my responsibilities was in, uh, immigration, refugees and race relations. So I was involved from then on. Then I lost my seat. Uh, after eight years in the Commons, uh, and and eventually I became chief executive of the Refugee Council. So that was a, for eight years I was doing that. Yes, um, and what sort of refugees were they at that point in your life? Well, I, I, the, I, the most dramatic ones was when the British government agreed to take several thousand Bosnians from those horrible Serb concentration camps, as I called them, uh, towards the end of the Bosnian War. And we in the Red Cross, we, the Refugee Council and the Red Cross, were jointly uh, asked by the Home Office to provide emergency accommodation, reception centres and so on. Uh, but the previous refugees, uh, had, there had been quite a lot of Vietnamese had still been coming and were still coming. Uh, and so those are the countries, and of course there have been some Hungarians a few, some years earlier, but the Refugee Council were involved in those. And of course people were escaping from persecution in, in other parts of the world, from parts of Africa and so on. So and were became, children prominent amongst these? They must have been. Did did parents at that point say say the ones from 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 Central Africa? Did they did they actually bring their children with them? Were they allowed to? Well, some of the children even came on their own. Um, uh, you know, they, already they, they, at they, that point, they were flown in, and we were busy trying to find uh, you know families and support and so on for them. So even then, it, it was quite quite an issue. I should mention that Nicky Winton. The man who organised the kinder transport from Prague, who I got to know very well, he died about three years ago. Great man. Uh, well, I would say he's a great man. He saved my life. <laughs> but, uh, yes, tell us how he saved your life. Just well, he, he saved my life because he organised the kinder transport, and without yeah. the kinder transport, I, I don't think I'd have survived the Holocaust. So it was straightforward. And he said to me on one occasion, "Can we not do something about the refugee children that are coming here from parts of Africa?" And I said, "That's a good point. Maybe I think we should." Anyway. To cut a long story short, I, I then lost my seat. I, I was the refugee council for some years, and then I was put in the Lords. And that's where my campaigning on child refugees actually got a got a new lease of life. Yes. Was was that a time of um, uh, great hard work for you? Or uh, you're very good at making speeches and everything. Did you manage to convince people that these children must be looked after properly, and especially those who have left parents behind? Well, well, the story, in, 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 very briefly, was this, that we discovered it was 2016, just after the, the terrible events in, in, in Syria, uh, and, and we learned that there were 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe, particularly in... 95,000? 95,000, uh, 95, according to Save the Children. Uh, uh, and and uh, they were in northern France, in the jungle in Calais, in Italy, uh, and in Greece. And actually, what was even more shocking was we learned from Interpol, the police body, that 10,000 of these children just simply disappeared. Well, you know, if one child disappears in Britain, we all go hunting and searching, and it's a disaster. But 10,000 children. Anyway, uh, uh, to cut a long story short, I moved an amendment to an immigration bill that happened to be going through the Lords to say that we should take uh, 3,000 of the refugees that were in Europe. A very small number. Uh, 3,000 for Great Britain, is that right? 3,000 for this country, yes. Yeah. Was that resisted by some people? 
Well, it resisted by the government. Theresa May was Home Secretary, uh, and the government didn't didn't want it to happen. Uh, and I was being, uh, uh, I mean, Theresa May as Home Secretary asked me to go and see her and asked me to withdraw the amendment. This was before the Lords voted on it. Uh, and I said, why should I? And she said, well, if the, uh, if the, um, these children come, others will follow. And I said, but this is shocking. I said to her, uh, you know, we can't turn our backs on children sleeping in the jungle, what was then the jungle in Calais, sleeping on streets, vulnerable to traffickers, to criminality, to prostitution. We just can't turn our back on them. So we parted company. And in parliamentary terms, it passed the Lords of the big majority. It got the Commons where it was slightly defeated. We went back to the Lords with a bigger majority, uh, although we had to drop the 3,000 figure for technical parliamentary gobbledygook reasons. Uh, anyway, but a lot of these children then did actually be, uh, uh, were allowed to stay in Britain. Was well, then what, well, yes, but could I just, just one step before that? What uh -huh. happened was that, that probably in, in the course of this parliamentary toing and froing with, with my bill, with my amendment, uh, British public opinion suddenly woke up to what was happening. I think it was pictures of people drowning in the Mediterranean. It was a Syrian boy called Alan Kurdi drowned on the Mediterranean beach. And people woke up to this. And I think public opinion suddenly took over. And public opinion said, these children should come. And they brought pressure to bear on government supporting MPs. I've, I've always made this cost party. I've never made this the property of one political party. But government supporting MPs uh, came under pressure. So Theresa May asked me to see her again. She was still Home Secretary and said the government proposed to accept the amendment. And they did. In a somewhat niggardly manner, they accepted the amendment, but they kept the numbers small. Uh, and Theresa May, did she ever sort of renege on that at all? Well, um, no. I mean, what, what she said was, or what the government then said was, that they're going to limit the number to, remember the original amendment was 3,000. We had to drop the figure. But the government told me they'd accept the letter and spirit of my amendment. And then what happened was that the government said very arbitrarily, we can only take 480. And I said, why? And they said, because local authorities cannot find any more foster families to take more than the 480. Well, I'm afraid I, I, I could only disprove that because I know from work we've done that the local authorities were willing and able to find more foster families to take the children. Mm -hmm. But that was just a negative thing. And the second arm to this was, of course, family reunion. But apart from my amendment, which was for children that didn't have family here, there was also a provision in the Dublin Treaty, an EU treaty, that we should take children, a child in an EU country uh, could apply to join relatives in another EU country. So a Syrian boy in France could apply to join a family in, say, Birmingham. Would, was it your opinion then uh, that most of the children who did come through um, and it was always interesting that the, the Lords were more liberal about this, I think, than, than the, the Commons. <laughs> um, uh, did, did any of them actually not find that they had parents at all to welcome them? I mean, were, yeah, were, there, were some of them absolutely lost and left? The, the 480 didn't, uh, the, that came under my First Amendment were specifically children that did not have family, family in Britain. Uh, and... and uh, uh, and, 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 so you had to rely on councils to look after them? Local, well, the model was in the main that local authorities would find foster families. They had to be qualified. You know, we had to protect children as well. So the foster, potential foster families, if they hadn't already been vetted, had to be vetted. But having said that, they would then foster the children and provide them with home, love, affection, and then a chance to go on with education. And did that work on the whole? I mean, did, did some of the children run away, perhaps? Well, on the on the whole, on the whole, it worked. Of course, there were problems. Look, uh, there was a Syrian boy who said to me once. Uh, he, he saw his uh, father blown up in front of him by a bomb in Aleppo or Damascus. When one has been through that, when one has gone through these terribly frightening long journeys, perhaps six months or longer, one has lived in a terrible camp or was left for a camp in, in Calais or on the Greek islands. You know, it's you, you know people are going to be shocked and traumatized, terribly shocked and traumatized. So, of course, there will, there will be difficulties. And one of my other campaigns is actually to provide mental health support, better mental health support for children. Mm. Who may, they may not need it, but they may. They may, and it should be available. Does the, is it available sort of largely now or better, better than it was? It's patchy. 
In some areas mm. it's quite good, in some areas it, isn't. it, it, it is patchy. And of course, uh, uh, you know, children don't want to be museum pieces either. We can't say you've got a men you must have a mental health problem because of what you've been through. That's entirely mm. wrong. There, there was a survey we did, and, and w w one saying boy said, "Don't don't treat me like a mental health case. I want to sing and dance and play football." You know, so, <laughs> so, yes. uh, uh, and indeed, the ambition has to be, or the aim has to be, to make to normalise life for, for these young people as much as possible. To mm. normalise them, to enable them to, as it were, behave like other children of their age, to help them get over their terrible experiences. Uh, can you distinguish um, between refugees and migrants? Um, the, the, uh, people often ask, what is a migrant and how is that person different from a, a refugee? Oh, well, uh, okay. <laughs> You've opened up a big issue there. Look, um, uh, a, a refugee is someone who has fled for safety in another country because of a fear of violence, torture, persecution, and possibly death. So there are people fleeing for safety, and they should be protected by United Nations, the 1951 Geneva Convention. A migrant is somebody who wants to move to another country. It's not unworthy to want to move to another country, but it doesn't give you that human rights protection. It is simply whether the country you want to move to is willing to take you and whether you can qualify qualify with, 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 with their requirements and so on. So migrants are people who flee for safety. They're vulnerable. They've had terrible experiences, and they're covered by international convention. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is determining who qualifies, because they come here and they may say, look, I, I've, I've had a terrible experience. And then the, it's the job of the authorities here. Hopefully they do it fairly, but there are all sorts of hiccups in this, uh, of, of determining whether they have a well-founded fear of persecution or not. And there are quite a few arguments about that. I know you feel passionately that um, the right to seek asylum is a, a fundamental human right, but there are, of course, lots of people who don't feel that way, and we may get some questions about that afterwards. But how hopeful are you that um, people will become more sympathetic towards the, 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 the terrible journeys that some of these families, and particularly the children with them, um, have taken to get here? What? Well, I think my feeling is that if we tell people in this country what it is that these young people have gone through, the terrible experiences, I quoted the boy in Aleppo, uh, the, the fear, uh, dangerous journeys, victims of trafficking and so on. And I think people in this country will become or are sympathetic if the message is explained, if the story is explained to them. Of course, there's some who are not happy and, uh, and they oppose it. But insofar as they understand, they do. On the other hand, there have been ups and downs in this. I'm afraid the Brexit referendum did turn the clock back. I was uh, going to ask you whether that made a difference, actually, to, to things. Well, I, I fear it did, because mm. I think I think it, it, it caused tensions, it caused conflict, and, and it made some people, refugees who are here, fearful, because they were, they were being told by, by their former neighbours to get out of the country. And I, I have no story that happened. I find that deeply shocking. So we've got to work, work our way, get over that again, and make sure that people get here, we give them the feeling that they're welcome. They should be welcome, and they have certain rights in life, but they should be welcome, and they're entitled to education and love and affection. What more basic things should young people have than that? Do you, do you think Great Britain um, has more unaccompanied children still than any other country in Europe? No, I don't think so. Uh, no. I, I think, I mean, our government says we have quite a few. No, uh, I think the Germans and, and the Swedes, for example. How many do you think we've we've got here? Just It's difficult to be accurate. Yeah, I, I don't know the, the exact number. But, uh, but, uh, I've got somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000. I mean, they must be, you know. Yeah, maybe more. I think, I, th I hope it's more than that. But 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 it, it's certainly, the numbers are not large. And look, all I'm arguing, and I've been arguing all along, is that we should take our share. I'm not saying we can take them all, by no means, but I think we should take our share along with other European countries. And that was the aim of my amendment with the 3,000 figure then. And it's still my aim that we should take our share and be sensitive to, to, to children who have some links for this country, particularly those who've got some family here. What, what's more basic a human right than to find safety with members of one's family? So you're, you're obviously still a keen sort of warrior about this subject. Well, well, I try and be. I mean, there are many voluntary organisations such as yours who are who 
uh, such as ours, when I say yours, ours, <laughs> the <laughs> famous bus, but others like Safe Passage and so on, uh, who who are uh, who who have a high level of commitment. There are some wonderful. I mean, we heard at the beginning the Youth Haven Trust is run by volunteers, and there's some wonderful volunteers working with refugees in this country, like the Youth Haven Trust. There are some wonderful uh, volunteers working in in, in 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 what's left of the jungle in Calais or on the Greek islands. So there are a lot of young people from this country who work with and for to support their vulnerable fellow human beings, and and these people won't let me stop any more than I want to stop. Oh. Well, now, in a moment, it would be nice to field some questions from people um, who we can't see, um, but who are interested in this subject and who will, will have been listening with great interest to what you said. Um, and um, Steve, uh, have you got some questions to give us? Hello? This is, uh, ah, this is a question um, from... Judith, Steve is our engineer, our, our very clever engineer, and he's. Uh, and this is a question from Judith, who's been listening. Um, please ask Alf how he became involved with the Ruth Heyman Trust in particular. Well, I, I, of course, I knew about the good work you're doing for quite a long time, but I think you invited me to become more associated with the trust. It was a, it was a lovely invitation. I felt very honoured and privileged to be asked, uh, and uh, I'd like to accept. So, you know, that's the way of locking politicians into something. But no, if, if an organization does such good work as the Ruth Heyman Trust does, what more, what le I couldn't do less than just agree when you invite me to join you. So oh. that, that's what happens, straightforward. Okay, any more questions coming up? From Victoria, here's one, um, who's, which Steve has, has gathered um, for you, um, uh, Alf, from Victoria. If you could speak to your six-year-old self, this is an interesting question. What would you tell him? Uh, <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, a six-year-old, or I'll I'll interpret it as, as as a little bit older as well. Uh, yes. Well, well, I would say several things. First of all, one is learn English. Okay, point number one. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, believe in yourself. Believe that there are things you can do. Don't feel you should be deterred from doing things. Set your sights high. This can be a wonderful country. It can be full of wonderful opportunities, but you've got to believe in yourself. I didn't believe in myself for a long time. I had oh, to be. Really? Well, no, no, I, I, no, because I said I can't go into, I can't stand for parliament. I can't do any of these things. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't believe I could do that. I didn't have that sort of self confidence. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, oh, no, no, I was. I was not not at all self confident when I was younger. I may may not be now, but I, I certainly wasn't then. And so so I'd say to a young refugee: believe in yourself, set your sights high, believe that you can do things, and persevere. And with a little bit of luck, persevere, uh, and and doors in this country, I hope, will be open to you. Uh, oh, here's a qu question from a, a namesake of mine, from Sue, another Sue. What do you think, Alf, about the government's new plan for immigration? I think that's the one that was um, featured in the Queen's speech uh, this yeah, year. Yeah. And it will be. That, that's will quite, be. quite an interesting one, yeah. Well, it, it's a good question. Thank you. Well, it, it will be a, the subject of legislation which will be presented to the Commons and then the Lords uh, in the not too distant future. Well, there are a number of things I don't like about it. Uh, for one thing, and I'm very nervous about it. The government is saying that, that that your acceptability as a refugee depends upon whether you have come legally or not legally. Ah, now, now we now, come to an interesting subject, yes. And, and that I think is crucial. You see, one of the things I've been campaigning for is that there should be legal paths to safety. Because if we give people a legal path to safety, they don't rely on traffickers, uh, and they can come properly, and they can come, everything can be planned, and so on. If there are no legal paths to safety, then people do, young people do, what we, we would do in their position, which is if we have particularly our family here or other reasons to other connections with this country, we, we, we get on the back of an unsaved dinghy. It must be desperate for people to risk their lives in that way, but clearly the desperation is, is a sign of how much they want to be able to do it. So one of yes. my criticisms of the government's document is that, that they are closing down on legal paths to safety. They say you've got to come from Jordan. It's worthwhile coming from Jordan or, or, or Lebanon or Turkey, that's fine. But but to close the door on the hundreds, if not thousands of refugees, particularly children who are in Europe at the moment, to close the door on them and say, you can't come to Britain, 
uh, because it's supposed to stop trafficking. And I'm afraid it won't stop trafficking. It, it's it's but, a field day for if if if, say, if the government close close the door, flying a legal path, then if there are no legal paths, the traffickers have a field day. Yes, I, that, that sort of does um, uh, make sense to me. But, a lot, but most people, uh, I would guess, who just casually heard somebody like your good self saying um, I, it doesn't matter whether they take a legal or an illegal route to come into Britain, sounds a bit sort of, you know, not quite right. Well, well, you understand I, I, that, I, it, that some people would, you know, I, I understand why you, why you say that it, it they, the, the, the illegal things just aren't, aren't really um, what they, they need. Well, I, I mean, prefer to call it, I prefer to call it irregular rather than illegal, because illegal, to call a human being illegal is not very nice either. Irregular, yes. Is a better word. I, look, I know. You know I, 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 unfortunately, that was, that, was, that was the word used, wasn't it? Yeah, and unfortunately, it is the word used, but I, I just try and make it clear that the dilemma yeah. for people is that they've come halfway across the world, some of them, and they want to find safety in, in this country. It's only a small number. Most of them stay in France and Germany and so on, but they want to find safety. Uh, and I would like as many as possible to come legally, to come regularly, to come, to come in a planned way so that they don't risk their lives and the traffickers don't have a field day. That surely is the most humane and sensible way for them to come here. And the government's proposal is to close yes, that particular... it does sound. Yeah. So, so things haven't really improved lately in terms of how uh, easy it is for people to get to this country, or, or perhaps I should reverse well, the phrase well, and say how difficult it is for people and their children they're, they're, to get here. They've, They've got worse because the government is trying to close these routes. And the government has, have also so far closed the route of family reunion, the one that used to exist under the European Union, which stopped at the end of December, which they have not reopened. So that a refugee child in, in say, Calais, who's got to Calais, who's got an uncle in Birmingham, can't get here anymore. And, and again, we're pushing the government on that one. Can I ask you or bring forward uh, for the questions? This has been asked by Tash. Um, who says, I think, I think Tash must be female, but forgive me if, if you're not Tash. In your amazing journey and career, who has inspired you most? Well, I've got a double answer to that. Uh, clearly, uh, Nicholas Winton, who organized the kinder transport yes. in Prague and saved 669 lives, uh, must, have, m m must be on my list. But, the, but I tell you who inspired me most. It's the volunteers. As I mentioned earlier, it's the volunteers from in this country or from this country who work with refugees, whether they're volunteers for the Youth Home and Trust or they're volunteers for safe, an organization like Safe Passage or Care for Calais. The volunteers, young people who are doing this for their fellow human beings, whether they're doing it in towns and cities in this country or whether they're doing it in refugee camps, uh, refugee camps or what's left of refugee camps in Greece and France. They're the people I think that are, I feel whenever I've met them. I feel both inspired and humbled that there are people willing to do so much for their fellow human beings. And I think that's terrific. And they should get all the public praise they can get because we tend to forget about them. Oh, well, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I do. And, you know, we, we know that the, um, the, the Ruth Heyman Trust relies entirely, as Mary told us, pretty much entirely on, on people who do it, do it as volunteers. Uh, my latest... Um, uh, uh, meeting with volunteers who did a great job was the people who vaccinated me in January and March. I mean, they they were they were under the supervision of um, of doctors, but you know they they come into there were hundreds of people wanting a, uh, almost a panic of people coming into this particular place near where I live. Um, but, but but could I add to my answer the question? Of course, the third people are the refugees themselves. I find some of them such impressive young people. Yes. You know, uh, committed to getting education, to working. And some of them said, we, we want to give back to this country, whatever we can, people who are absolutely terrific. So there are three, there are three lots of people, the volunteers, um, the, 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 Nick, Nicholas Winton, the volunteers and the refugees themselves. They're the three lots that have really impressed me. Well, here's another question for you, um, uh, which is from Meg. What helped you, Lord Dubs, to believe in yourself? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we sort of skated around that a little earlier, didn't we? 
but I, um, I, I feel I'm on a psychiatrist's couch here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, look, uh, look, uh, you know. Uh, my mother didn't know much about this country. You know, she struggled to get a job and, and, and keep things going. I was luck lucky that I, I had her after my long after my father died when I was seven. Uh, I, I suppose where does one get self confidence from? Well, I just, it took me a long time. I had to work at it. I suppose friends did, people who encouraged me. Uh, you know, teachers at school, friends who uh, who encouraged me uh, and said, so just keep going. Don't hold yourself back. And in the end, I began to recover, get a sort of a sense of belief. I also happen to believe in, in the politics I was putting forward. I know politicians don't have such a good name these days, but I actually believe that, <laughs> that, that politics is worthy in terms of changing things for the better for our fellow human beings. And so I met a lot of friends in politics. And all together, these people encouraged me and made me feel maybe I can do these things. Maybe I can believe in myself. But it, it, it was a process. It doesn't come overnight. Oh, well, here's a question to you, which sort of naturally follows on from that, um, as it happens, from Lindy. Um, but, but by the way, it's, it's always the girls who are talking to you, <laughs> not not the not the chaps. But anyway, um, I should, I should Lindy, be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the most useful thing that you could say or do for the child refugees that, and this is her local town she refers to, that my local town of Belpa is soon to welcome? into our community? What's the most useful thing that they can do to welcome them? What, the local community? What, what yes. the, the, ah. the local community in Belpa. The child refugees in her local community. Well, well first of all, take them, <clears throat> take them to heart. Make them, help them to feel part of the local community. Not different, but part of the local community. Whether the path is through sport or through some leisure activity, learning language and so on. Make them feel part of it. Make them feel and help them to feel that they that, that, that they belong. Look, you know, That sport, could include anything from sort of sewing to the, playing sports or painting yeah, or even helping that. others um, needing help all yourself. Of that. Yes. Absolutely, all of that. Anything that makes you that, that makes you contribute to the local community and doing it with other people in the local community. So you're doing it all together uh, as refu as refu refugees helping. I think these these are the important things. Uh, you know what we're trying to do is to normalise life for refugees. I know it sounds a terrible word, normalise, but to make it's all right. We, we we're used to it. <laughs> it is a terrible word, probably. Yeah. Uh, and, to, and to make them feel that they're part of their local community, they can contribute, they can take part, they don't have to feel different, that they can do it, but they also that they have a contribution to make from because they own background. They probably have things that they can do, which which, uh, which their contemporaries can't do. So all these things together make up a picture. But get, above all, get them involved, get them doing these things. Well, here's, here's, I think this must have to be the last question. I'm sure there are more, lots more for you, but let, let me uh, assume this is the last one. Um, uh, this comes from Jake. We've got a chat now. This is good. All right. Um, <laughs> could you, uh, could you Alf, name some individuals who came to the UK as a refugee and have since made great contributions to the UK? And modestly, you will leave yourself aside. Perhaps. Oh God! Oh, there's a there's a long. I can't say how. There's 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 a, there's a long list of people. I think the main problem is that I was one of the youngest, and so most of them are older, and 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 they're not they're not always around. But there's some refugees who campaigned hard for their fellow refugees. Uh, they, they've worked they've worked with the local groups. They worked with faith groups, with synagogues. They've, they've done all these things. I, I I don't think I can mention any names. I, I can think of a few, but that wouldn't be fair. I've met so many who've actually. D determined to play their part and do, to do what they can to help this country. And what I say, what I say always is that uh, I would like to feel that the young refugees that are coming to Britain today are given the same opportunities and welcome that I was given. I think that that is actually my my ambition for them. But I could go through a list of names, but I'd have to. I'd have no, to it, would, it would be difficult to do that. But but um, obviously there are some who have made a great contribution, and that that much of that must be used must be due to people like yourself who've, who've really well, done they it. May, well, they're doing it today as well. I mean, there are people who come uh, in the world, in the fields of medicine, in the fields, in, you know, in the academic world, in the fields of science, a at a local level, in, the, in working in communities. There are all sorts of people who are making contributions, and people can make their contributions in their own way. Don't expect every refugee to be an Einstein. You know, there's only one Einstein every three generations. 
Uh, that's not what it's about. What it's about that everybody should be able to make a contribution to the best of their potential and ability. That's, that's what it is. And some people do it at a, at a local level. Some people do it at a national level. And some people get, get their names in lights and some people don't. But, but my, my sense of it is that refugees, what they're anxious to do is to get jobs, uh, is to, is to get education, to get jobs and be part of our society. They don't want to be on the dole. They don't want to be sitting around doing nothing. What they want to do is to be, is to be given the necessary help to get into our education, to get into our communities, and to be able to make their contribution. That's what they ask. That's what they ask me. They want to tell me they want to do. And really, we've got to facilitate that. That's our job. Lord Dubs, it was a, a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm going to invite Mary, the, the esteemed chair of the Ruth Heyman Trust, to say a few words to end this. Mary. Well, I'd like to thank you both hugely. Um, Lord Dubbs, I couldn't agree with more with everything you've said. And uh, I think in the Ruth Heyman Trust, we see lots of refugees who make amazing contributions and do get on to get good jobs and work. And people like Naima, who are then giving back things, to her, so which is, is fantastic. And probably most people don't know about this, all these the good things that refugees are are doing perhaps we ought to be uh, kind of publicizing that 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 more anyway it's been a fantastic interview so um thank you so much for um everything and all the preparation you've put into it uh, we're really lucky to have such a uh, wonderful patrons can i well, just it was a great pleasure to, to, to see all of you together but and uh, but just if, just to but in, um, do you also have children that you deal with who don't have families, um, Mary? No, we don't directly deal with children. We deal with adults. So we give grants yes. to adults. But I think that, um, you know, if you've got a, a happy family and, uh, you know, that, that must rub off on the, uh, on the children and adults who are, who are achieving. Yeah. But I'd just like to say something about the money we've raised. So through uh -huh. this event, we, are, um, we were aiming for £2,000. We've actually had a very large donation from somebody, which is absolutely amazing. Uh -huh. And um, although we say we've raised over £900, in fact, there's quite a lot more coming in. So I'd like to thank everybody who supported us. And... Uh, I mean, we're particularly delighted to have this sort of large donation, which has come in Refugee Week. And uh, I of think course, we're, I didn't mean, I should have mentioned right at the top. We're in the dead in the middle of Refugee Week, aren't we? Appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we are. Yes. Yeah. And our fundraising is specifically for refugee education. So Fantastic. A huge thank you to, to both of you. Um, it's been a learning experience for us doing our first online event. Um, and I think we'll probably <laughs> be less nervous about it the next time. But oh, thank good. You. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you to everybody. Um, and I, I, I have a feeling Alf wants to, to butt in here. Alf. Well, I was going to say, could I just say thank you very much indeed. And thank you, thank you for putting up with me and asking me the nice questions and thank you for having me along and and good 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 luck good good luck to to to, to what you're doing and and thank you very much and thank you to the audience for the questions look we're all well, this thank together you, thank you and i think we'd really want to support you in any kind of work you're doing in 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 parliament to uh yeah promote things for refugees so but anyway we'll be be in touch i hope i'm sure well, she'll be in touch Alf, So. Watch well, out. <laughs> you know where I am. I think you know where I am. So, <laughs> just let me know. But, but serious, a sincere thank you to all of you in the audience and 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 to the, and to the two of you. Thank you very much indeed. Bless thank you. you very much and good goodbye, everybody. Oh, I know one thing I was going to say, which I, I'm awfully sorry I forgot, is that if there's anyone in the audience who would like to join us, follow us on Facebook or social media, or get our newsletters please get in touch with us and our um, email info at ruthhaymantrust.org UK. Um, we'll be happy to, to respond. So hopefully we'll get some more followers from, from today. That's great. Good. Go, goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>